It's a big subject, the round table. It doesn't sound very big, but the interesting part about it is that one moves into the Arthurian theme. You're dealing with a number of different aspects. So you're, you're dealing with tradition and culture, then mythology, and then history. Now, somewhere within our familiar knowledge of the subject, these things mingle and intertwine so that by the time we've come out of it, it's all been terribly fascinating, but it's difficult to know what was the reality and what was the mythology. Legend is the word I prefer because legend can be both. It can be history and mythology linked together, and it's people today are classified as legends mainly because of a lot of what was written about them and is written about them is quite untrue and they become legendary because of it. So Arthur was no different, but Arthur has quite a, an interesting history. From about 800 BC, this is where we'll begin the story, around 800 BC, various tribes from Central Europe who'd spent the last thousand years or more travelling mainly eastwards into countries like Tibet and Mongolia, down into Mesopotamia, northern India, decided to look westwards. And they moved across from Central Europe into Western Europe and, and to Britain. Among these tribes are those which historically or mythologically we've come to know as the Tuathadadanan, Thurbolg tribes, Irish kings, the, you know, these early, early kings whose mythology has got linked up with history. They came, I in essence, the, the picked she, the picks of, of Scotland and Caledonia and, and the picks of Ireland and the picks of France, but were the picked she, uh, who in fact, with their little pointed hats and things, it, it became the sort of model for the pixies of, of mythology. Scythia was the name of their country, and it had no boundaries, it spread from Transylvania to Tibet. It was wherever they were, was Scythia. Or, as some people like to pronounce it, Scutta, Scythia. I mean, it seems to have no correct pronunciation. So from the Carpathian Mountains to the Russian River Don was basically the homeland of these tribes, and they moved towards here. The Greek historian Herodotus um, was writing in about the 5th century BC, and he wrote about a part of ancient Scythia which became known as Sarmatia. And the Sarmatians were a cousin race to the, to the Scythians, who were called the Royal Siths. And they'd moved a long time before into the regions of Persia, and they'd come back. They'd come back to Central Europe, and, and they were Sarmatians. Their language was very, very similar. Their whole culture had been retained, even through all their hundreds of years in, in Persia and, and Mesopotamia. And the only difference that seemed to be prominent in their culture was that their armies contained women, which the Scythians didn't. So they had, they had women, and they, the, the women were mainly archers. The men were spear, spearmen, the women were archers, and they were wonderful horse archers, apparently. They moved into the British islands. Horse archers, their weaponry was famed. Just as the steel makers of Toledo, who were set up by the the Jews, a little before the time of Christ, have, have become the most famous blade makers in history since the first century. Jewish families who, who started up uh, manufacturing products in Spain. Uh, so the Toledo uh, steel works and, and, and foundries for weapons are really, really famous now and have been for a long time. At that time, the central tribe responsible for making weapons, the swords and the spears, for the Scythians and Sarmatians were called the Calibs. And the Calibs weren't warriors, they were specifically founders, iron workers, that sort of thing. And we find that the word Calib in the oldest Arthurian traditions was what King Arthur's sword was called. It came from exactly that tradition. It then moved into being called Caliburn, which was simply a, uh, an extension of the name. It then became Excaliburn, and then in later stories the N went off the end and it became Excalibur. So what we have here is, within the Arthurian legends, the beginning of being able to see a, a sword culture that went back to 
hundreds of, of years before. The Caleb tribes were working in Central Europe in about 1500 BC and they were still making swords and weapons at the time of King Arthur. One of the best known tales in Scythian Sarmatian sword mythology told of the hero called Batrats. Batrats. And Batrats was a great warrior, a great war leader. And, and the story is that, that when he received his final death wound, Batrats called a couple of his warrior knights to him and he said, look, you must take Caleb, that was the name of his sword, you must take Caleb and cast it into the lake. And anyway, Caleb was a pretty valuable and very famous sword and he was dying anyway, so the knights sort of went behind a tree and came back and said, okay, we've done that. And he said, no, you haven't. And they said, well, yeah, we did. And he said, no, you haven't. I will know when you've done it. When you've thrown Caleb into the lake, I'll know. So anyway, they finally conceded and off they went and they hurled Caleb into the lake. And the story tells that the water became very turbulent. A great light came out of the water. The, st the sword shone in the water even though it was sinking and whatever. Now, of course, in Sir Thomas Mallory's famous Arthurian story of 1485, precisely the same legend gets brought up again. Maybe it was a legend originally, maybe it was partly true, who can tell in the days of Batrat, but the story of the sword being cast into the lake is pretty much identical. The difference is that the knights have different names and it's Bedivere who in that story disobeys King Arthur twice and refuses to throw the sword into the lake. When he finally does, the Lady of the Lake catches the sword and everybody knows that it was really done. So what we have is the beginning of how history, just like with Tolkien and the Ringlords, how history and, and traditions of much older times were, were brought into play and given to King Arthur by the writers of the Middle Ages in Europe and Britain. The military banner of the Sarmatians was a dragon, a red dragon on their war banner. The bearer of the standard which, which carried this dragon was called the Draconarius. And what happened was that the emblem was stolen as a military <coughs> victory prize by the legions of Marcus Aurelius, the emperor. He defeated the Sarmatians of Hungary in 175, the year 175 AD, transported many, many thousands of captives to Britain, and uh, they were seconded to the Roman troops of a fellow called Lucius Artorius Castus. So we're in 175 AD now, we're sort of creeping towards Arthurian times, we're sort of in there in the Dark Age period, and the Roman legions were then given this red dragon, this standard as their, their new banner to celebrate their victory. So all of these Sarmatians have now been seconded to the Roman armies in Britain. They're still carrying their standard, but now it's Roman. Later on, when the Romans withdrew from Britain in, in about 410, AD 410, the regional leaderships changed local chieftains and, and local kings began to take back the regions that their families used to control and by 418 uh, one of the, the the greatest of all of these regional uh, kings was a fellow called Vortigern of Powys in, in Wales and Vortigern being the senior king at the time was awarded the Sarmatian banner the Romans had gone and they said, well, we don't really need it anymore. In fact, they did continue to use it a, a while afterwards, but they gave it to him as, as the prize. And they said, look, it, it, over to you, you can have the Red Dragon. So Vortigern of, of Powys was in actual fact responsible at that time in 418 for introducing the Red Dragon that became the national flag of Wales. And that's the story. So in fact, like all things, the oldest of stories has an even older tradition. <coughs> So the Red Dragon of Wales was actually being used long, long before in Central Europe by the Sarmatian cavalry that actually moved across to Britain. Anyway, this La Arth Lucius Arthurius Castus fellow had his name sort of recorded a a along with the, the doings of those times and it's been suggested over fairly recent years, I mean within the last 30 or 40 years by a number of writers that in fact 
Artorius, that middle name, might very well be significant in the name of Arthur. I mean, supposing this chap Lucius Artorius Castus happened to have um, a, a descendant a few generations further on that was called Artorius, not that anybody's ever found that ancestor, then that was probably King Arthur. Well, doesn't make a lot of sense actually because Arturius meant bear-like in Roman language and the name Arthur, as we'll get to in a minute, means nothing like that at all. In the, the years of the British Empire, which I suppose have probably totally fallen apart now, although we still give out empire medals and make people MBEs and OBEs as if it still exists, but in the days when the empire reigned strong, it became a part of our popular culture for, for everything that was good about our nation, everything that was important to be related to imperial structure, because we were the world's biggest empire at the time. And so, in looking back in history, the Roman Empire became regarded in the way we were taught it as if it was something really quite inspiring and quite special for this country. We even had to study Latin and, and, and all of this sort of stuff because of it. We, we had to have it knocked into us that empires were, were something special and the Romans were the, um, were the key to this and uh, they really set up our nation. Well, in fact, what we know from history is, of course, they didn't set up our nation. They were here for a 300 years or so and they left and we carried on more or less like we were before. In fact, we, we gained a lot from them in certain ways, but in terms of real culture, nothing very much changed. So we were told that Romans, Roman officers were at the root of everything. Out of this grew all sorts of stories, some of which are still published by people today. Arthur was the son of a Roman officer. Ah, Lu Artorius Castus, that must have been him. Even Jesus, in many books, became the son of a Roman officer. Not that any document ever said it from those times, not even the Bible, but it was put forward as an idea, because if he was important, then he must have been the son of a Roman officer. Well, it seems to have gone now. But the problem with Artorius is that although there are those historians and writers today who still like to proclaim that the Latin Artorius must be where the name Arthur came from, the fact is that it's completely untrue. In, in fact, studying documents that go way back before the time that the Romans ever came to these shores, we had kings called Arthur. Even the famous King Art, whose name was abbreviated, had the, his sons, Cormac MacArt, as we know him, Cormac MacArt, and Arthur MacArt, two sons, third century sons. Way back in the fifth century BC, King Arthur Mesdalman was king of Irish Legain. So we can go back long before the Romans to find Arthur as an Irish rooted Gaelic name. No doubt of it. Arthorius or any allusion to the fact that the name Arthur comes from anything Latin meaning bear like or whatever is, is totally out of context with, with the history of the name. It goes back a long way and in various kingly dynasties, the name Arthur kept coming up, particularly in those dynasties that emerged from those ancient Irish, Irish kings of the Scythian races who came over in about 800 BC. Alongside the Scythian and Sarmatian cultures, a mythology with magical swords grew up in general, and it spread throughout parts of Europe. Swords became magical things. Apart from Batrats, in, in the Volsunga saga, the Norse saga of, of Odin, Sigurd and Brunhild, which moved into the Nibelungen stories of, of uh, Burgundian Germany later on, there's a wonderful story of how Prince Sigmund of the Volsunga story was attempting to proved that he really was the descendant in the royal line, the Volsunga line, Icelandic strain of great kings. 
And there was only one way he could prove it, and this was laid down in the culture of the land, because many, many years before, the god Odin had taken his sword and driven it to its hilt into the stump of a tree. And it was said that only the prince who can draw Odin's sword from the stump of this tree would be the real king. Anyway, Sigmund did it. So Sigmund was proclaimed king. It's a fascinating and very popular story, but once again, like the story of the sword and the lake, up it pops again in Arthurian tradition because it is totally equated. In fact, the only difference in the way that the story is told is that the stump of a tree becomes a stone. Otherwise, same story. So, King Arthur, everybody's been looking for King Arthur. Who is he historically? Maybe we knew and maybe we didn't know about these stories of the sword mythology, whether they were true or whether they weren't, but there had to have been a King Arthur, so who was he? And everybody chunts around uh, looking for King Arthur. He's been a descendant of Lucius Artorius Castus. He's been um, the son of the Roman governor, Magnus Maximus. He's been the Welsh Lord Owen Danktgwyn. He's been um, oh, Arthurus at Murig of Gwent. And he's even been St. Armel of Brittany. And these are all books that have been written in the last 10 or 15 years. But all of these people, none of whom are called Arthur, and yet, books are put together trying to explain how, along the way, somebody writing down the story got the name wrong. And he became Arthur instead of Arthurus ap Murig. Well, that's a pretty easy mistake, I would have thought. Anyway, <laughs> St. Armel of Brittany, he's on the list of Arthurs. The fact is, it doesn't really matter whether one's looking for Arthur or anybody else. <coughs> you might as well look for who you're looking for. So if one is looking for an historical king called Arthur, it seems to make sense to look for documents about a historical king called Arthur. <laughs> not, not about somebody else, who's, a bit of whose life vaguely fits the bill, now that the journalist on the spot got his name wrong when recording the story. So we need to look for Arthur. Well, in fact, at the time of the Arthurian, the time the legends and the stories are portrayed, we're, we're sort of looking in, in the 5th, 6th century era, uh, we actually find that there were indeed two kings, both called Arthur. In fact, they reigned in a sort of a crossover fashion, and in a funny way, they were mildly related. One was Arthur, Prince of David in Wales. Now, Arthur, Prince of David, was installed by St. Dubricius um, in the year 506. And he has quite a history, and if at any time any of you are up on the North Exmoor coast, there's a church there at Porlock, near Minehead, which will actually explain to you how that was where St. Dubricius installed King Arthur of Defid. Whether it was or whether it wasn't isn't terribly relevant, because historically this fellow wasn't terribly popular. He was a prince, they didn't call them kings in Wales then, he was a prince of Wales from 506, installed by the church, and he and his forebears were hated by the Welsh people. He was descended from Desi royalty in Leinster, in Ireland, and they were a pretty troublesome lot, the Desi royalty. And what happened was that when the Roman troops left the Welsh shores in 383, this family decided that they'd come over from, from Ireland and take over before the Welsh had time to do too much to put themselves in order. Well, as we've discovered, Vortigern did put Wales in, into a sort of control, but along came this Arthur, Arthur. Settled in, in David and became the prince appointed by the church. Now, this Arthur appears in a lot of literature, to a large extent, church promoted literature in, in the lives of the saints in particular, in the lives of 
St. Caranog and St. Cadoc and, and others, this, this King Arthur appears quite a lot. He is talked about in the 10th century Annals of Wales. He, he moves into there and he led incursions in, into Gwynedd and Powers and these other parts of Wales to the north of Gwynedd where he really wanted to take control and he was always fighting with the regional kings, Vortigern included. And this guy was, was a problem. Anyway, this fellow died in battle, Arthur of David in 537, at a battle called the Battle of Camlan in, in, in Wales. Now, the, the battlefield of Camlan sits just a little to the south of, uh, south of Dinas Malfi. <coughs> it's a famous battlefield. It's a bit like the battlefield of Harmegiddo in Palestine. You know, any important battle had to be fought there. So it didn't matter where you started your argument, you had to trek off there to have the battle, <laughs> because that was the battleground. So anyway, he's killed there at the Battle of Camlan in 537. This goes down on record. And it begins to get mixed up now with the legends, because in certain Irish, uh, certain Welsh literature, stories about this Arthur begin to get brought into the stories about the Arthur of legend, and little bits of his life creep in. But was that the Arthur of, of Grail lore and the Arthurian romances? Well, it transpires that it wasn't. Not one thing in his life really has anything to do with what we know about King Arthur. At that time, the tradition was for, for families to reign throughout the Celtic realms. So if you had a, a kingly family reigning in a part of Ireland, then a part of that family was likely to move across to the mainland and, and govern parts of northern Wales or even northern Britain. And in fact, there, there are great tracts of land moving up into southern Scotland, the ga lands of the Gary Garath, Garath and, and Manow on the Forth, and, and these places, which were all governed by Irish and Welsh princes, or, although they, are, they were seen to be in England or Scotland, not that Scotland existed at that time. The Scots kings themselves, of course, were Irish initially. They came over from Ireland in the 500s and, and settled Scottsdale Riada, which included a part of Northern Ireland and all of the Western Isles and the Western Highlands. So the culture is the same, and what actually happened was that names became duplicated. So, for example, what, what you have in, in Wales is, is the, the, the region called Brecknock, or however the Welsh pronounce it, and, and the main centre of, of Brecknock is Brecon. So that's okay. Uh, it just so happened that the king of the time was called Brecon, and Brecon's family moved into northern, northern England to, to, to reign across Northumbria and southern Scotland. One interesting thing that I learned in, in doing this study was that I was informed that actually Brecon, although we call them the Brecon Beacons and all that sort of thing, it, it apparently wasn't pronounced Brecon at all. This is a strange English way of pronouncing the name. It was actually the Old Welsh for Brian. So King Brecon was actually King Brian which doesn't sound so magical. <laughs> so I'm going to stick to Brecon. <coughs> so there was then, he, in Scotland, they founded a new region, which his brother and then subsequently his son reigned in, and that was called Brecknock, just the same as it was in Wales. And the main centre of that Brecknock in Scotland was called Brecon. Well, Scots language changed that a little. It now becomes Brecon. Uh, so we now have Brecon in Wales and Brecon in Scotland, but essentially the same name, for the same reason in times gone by. Now, lots of names like that were replicated. So we have the stories of King Arthur dying in 537 at the Battle of Camlan in Wales, Prince of Difford. Uh, this has gone down as part of the Arthurian mythos that this is where King Arthur died. And this is the year that he died at the Battle of Camlan. Now there's more truth in that than it might seem because in other literature the King Arthur of Braille Law is said to have died at Camlan. However, we move up into southern Scotland at, at the time and what do we find? In the year 600, King Arthur of Southern Dalriada died at the Battle of Camlan, west of Falkirk. Same name, same kingly name,
same battleground name. Reason was because of all these duplications that were taking place. And this is where we begin to find an Arthur that on every count, apart from Ladies of the Lake and Swords, but on every historical count begins to be the Arthur that we are so familiar about, or so familiar with. The Battle uh, of Camlan is detailed in the Chronicles of the Picts and the Scots. It's detailed in various Irish records. Look for it in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles and you won't find it. Look for it in the Welsh Annals and you won't find it. It appears in Scots and Irish Annals. Not only do the Scots Chronicles relate that this Arthur was proclaimed the sovereign command of the Britons in 575, but in historical terms, and given that we know who all 26 of them were, he was the only Arthur in all history ever to be born the son of a Pendragon. So the story gets tighter. Prince Arthur of Dalriada, the son of King Aidan MacGabran of Scots. His mother was a Gurna Davalon. Interesting. Because her own mother, Vivian de Lac, who reigned in a part of Burgundy, was the classified Lady of the Lake. Recorded in Burgundian records, Lady of the Lake. It was a style which ran in her family descent for generations. From the time that Mary Magdalene gained the title Great Lady of the Waters, a strain of great kings in, in the southern French regions and into Burgundy were called Ladies of the Waters, Ladies of the Lake. And Vivienne de Lac, Vivienne of the Waters, was the Lady of the Lake. Her daughter was Igerna de Lavalon, uh, Davalon, Igerna of Avalon. Igerna of Avalon was the wife of Aidan MacGabran of Dalriada, the Pendragon of all Britain, whose son was Arthur, the sovereign commander of the Britannic Isles. So this feels much more like the fellow, doesn't it? This is what the sort of stuff that we're looking for. So we look for other things. Well, all right, Arthur had a sister called Morgana in the stories, Morgan Le Fay, or called by other names. Let's look for her. Well, actually, the first thing I discovered before discovering Morgana was that he had a son. And I found this in, in, in the um, strangest of chronicles of Scottish history written by the church and by the governors of these various kingdoms. And they all kept telling of the great importance of Prince Modred, son of Arthur MacAidan. We then find that he did indeed have a sister called Morgana. In fact, she was called Morgane, and she's referred to, the, uh, the Royal Irish Academy have got a, a very proud display that nobody from England has ever taken any notice of whatever, that actually points out that she was actually called M Morgane, daughter of Aidan in Balak Gabran. Aidan in Balak Gabran, was Aidan of Dalriada, the son of King Arthur, so Morgane becomes Arthur's sister. So we now have a mother called Igerna, which translates in Gaelic from the old Franco-Scots language into Igraine. We have a daughter called Morgane, which is Morgana or whatever, and we have a son called Modred. And we have a father who's the Pendragon of all Britain. You don't actually have to invent somebody whose name might have been changed to Arthur. <laughs> because without any doubt at all, every single thing that every piece of Arthurian history tells us about this guy is laid down as documented historical fact from the time. Arthur MacAidan is, is cited specifically in the um, seventh century life of St. Columba, written by St. Adonan of Iona who um, was the successor of, of St. Columba, of the Celtic Church. St. Columba was, was the first priest in Britain to ever install a king. And the king that he installed was King Aidan of Dalriada. So the links were, were very strong. 
first priestly ordina ordination, the first church appointed monarch was, was King Aidan. So religion creeps into the family. You can begin to see how this Christian thing is, is getting in there from a, 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 a pagan dimension in those times. Who was it then, it comes the question, that installed Arthur? Because Arthur didn't actually succeed his father as the king of Dalriada. During his father's lifetime, he was referred to as the High King of the Britons. So his father's the Pendragon, he's king of the Western Highlands and the Isles. His son is actually in a superior position as the High King of Britain. Well, we don't really have to look much further again than the um, Chronicle of the Scots. We find it also in the Chronicle of the Picts. We find it in the Chronicles of Holyrood. We find it in the Chronicles of Melrose, in the Tiganac Annals, and the Books of Leinster, and the Books of Ballymote. All of these Scottish and Irish chronicles at the time tell us that in the year 574, Arthur MacAidan was appointed sovereign commander of the Britons, High King of the Britannic Isles, and installed by Merlin Emrys of Powys. There's another name. Merlin suddenly appears in the picture. <coughs> Merlin Emrys of Powys, and the interesting thing about Merlin Emrys of Powys is that he brings us back to the Welsh collection. Powys again comes into the picture. Arthur's father, in the line of Pendragons, which actually started with Caractacus, he was the first nominated Pendragon of these islands. Arthur's father was regarded as so fearsome in battle, and these chronicles tell about the massive assaults that he made uh, to, to prevent English incursions you know, from these people down south and whatever. He was really fierce, and they called him the Terrible Pendragon. Aidan the Terrible, the Terrible Pendragon. Well, if you translate the word terrible into the Gaelic language at the time, you get Uther, because Uther was the word for terrible. So, in these texts, Aidan Magabran becomes the Uther Pendragon, the terrible Pendragon. Celtic Church of Scotland records, very useful for this, because the Celtic Church was really the church of St. Columba and of this kingly family at the time, not the Roman Church as such. So, the Celtic Church records are quite interesting, and, and it, it's from there that I got the, the terrible connotation, actually, interesting, because Uther Pendragon, which wasn't mentioned, actually, in, in any Arthurian story until 1135, when Geoffrey of Monmouth wrote up his histories, suddenly appeared. And yet the only record I could find of him being called Uther Pendragon appeared, appeared in Celtic church records. So Geoffrey of Monmouth, in writing up his, his Arthurian stories all those hundreds of years later, must have had an access two church records of, of previous times. Well, he wrote the history of the kings of Britain in 1135. He later became the bishop of, of St. Uh, Asaph in, in Wales. But the interesting thing about Geoffrey of Monmouth was that he was commissioned to write this history of Britain. Not the history of England, the history of Britain in the 1100s. And much like I might be commissioned to write a book today, he was commissioned. So I give my, my publisher a few ideas for a book that I might have next on the stocks, and they say, well, this is the idea we like. Uh, we can actually see that, that now, uh, I, I don't know, uh, your Canadian market is really picking up, so we want you to give the book a, a heavy Canadian slant so that we can sell it big in Canada. That's the way publishing is done today. It was exactly the way it was done then, exactly the way. Geoffrey of Monmouth, was commissioned by Robert, the Norman Earl of Gloucester. And um, so we're not long after 1066 and the Norman invasion. We've got now the, the Earl of, uh, uh, of Gloucester commissioning this guy to write up the stories of King Arthur and various other things about the history of Britain, but make them all English. Make, make Britain England and, and make everybody important in these stories, English in, in some way. So, um, Uther Pendragon moved into Geoffrey's stories as an English king. Arthur began to have English connotations. 
the Welsh history was still there in the background. Nobody down here knew very much about what had ever gone on up in Scotland, really, because, you know, Hadrian's Wall and things have been... I mean, nobody could get up there from down here. So it, Scottish history was a secret. They got moved down either into Wales or to Cornwall or any part of this sort of southwestern part of England um, or southern England. And Je Geoffrey's monumental trick to, to cement the whole thing was that he knew that Arthur's mother was a Gurner of Avalon. Now Avalon is, is apart from being a sort of a, a mystical Celtic name, is actually a place. There were kings and queens of Avalon for centuries and Avalon is in Burgundy. Still exists today if you look on the map, it's, it's still there. They were a cousin race to the Merovingian kings of the Franks and they ruled in parallel succession kings of Avalon, queens of Avalon generally, rather than kings and, and, and the Merovingians. So he knew that guy was, um, that Igerna was Arthur's mother. He also knew that before she married Aidan, Arthur's father, she was previously married to the warlord of Carlisle, the Dux de Caruel, as they called him, the warlord of Carlisle. And this chap was called Ger Lu. Ger Lu, probably, something like that. So he amended the name into a, a more English sounding Gorloi and called him, instead of Ger Lu of Carlisle, he became Gorloi of Cornwall. And the title that he held of Dux, D U X, which meant warlord, got translated to Duke. And so we have the Arthurian stories beginning from the time of Geoffrey with, with Arthur being born to Igraine, to Igerna, fathered by the Uther Pendragon on the wife of the dying Duke Gorloi of Cornwall. So in a way the stories are kind of true but the locations and the characters have been moved down a few hundred miles. What became particularly apparent to people not long afterwards, in fact it was pointed out very, very shortly after this was published, people were scratching their heads and they were saying, we believe that Geoffrey's history is mythological. All sorts of people began to doubt Geoffrey's history of Britain. And yet there seemed to be no really good reason because it was highly authoritative and, and read really very well for the time. And the reason that they decided it was probably mythological was because he called Gorloi Duke of Cornwall. And he's talking about the 6th century. There was no such thing as a duke anywhere in Britain in the 6th century. Nobody could have been duke of anywhere in the 6th century because the title didn't come across to this country until the Norman invasion. And the dukes appeared in the 11th century. So it began to stir things up. Anyway, the, the traditions persisted and he explained that, that this, this duke had a great castle at Tintagel down in Cornwall. That's still part of the Arthurian mythos today. The, the, the uh, sort of Avalon centre is down at Tintagel and all that had just been built probably 10 or 15 years before he wrote his history and relating it to a few hundred years before. In fact, what was there before was an old Celtic monastery and its history can be traced way back, certainly to Arthurian times and beyond. Well, everybody attacked him. William Malmesbury said, well, Geoffrey's writing is dubious stuff and William of Nuba actually said, everything the man took pains to write concerning Arthur and his prede predecessors was invented. Well, not absolutely true. A lot of the stuff wasn't invented because a lot of it he got from histories. It was the location that was wrong. He didn't invent it, he took it from Scots and Irish records and gave it an English base. Moved the story down. Anyway, by that time, Arthur and Uther had become terribly important historically. Everybody wanted to be related to them. This is where Arthur and Uther began to be quite useful. 300 years um, after the time of 
Geoffrey of Monmouth, well we go through the period of the Norman kings, we move into the house of Plantagenet, we have the Wars of the Roses, we've got Lancaster battling with York, and Richard of York finally ends up being defeated at the Battle of Bosworth Field in 1485 by the Earl of Richmond. The son of the Earl of Richmond, no less. Who now has got the sword and the crown. But what's his heritage? Well, his heritage is sort of... Well, we've been Earls of Richmond um, for a couple of generations, and then we've got this sort of Welsh heritage that, that goes back, and, and actually I've got this because I'm better in battle than he was, and my name's Tudor, and I'm Henry, and I'm going to be king. And, and so people started to fuss and flurry. Well, my goodness, Henry VII, new king, Tudor, you've got to have an ancestry, you've got to have something powerful, you've got to have something really important behind you, because you have just defeated the house of Plantagenet that has reigned here for God knows how long, and was really important in France before they even got here, you have to have an ancestry that outdoes theirs. And yet you trace to a sort of um, a Lord Mayor once in Wales. So, they put together a, a, a sort of plan. Margaret Beaufort was Henry's mother. She was, she was English. So she thought, well, what we need is, is, is to cement a genealogy. We need to pull out of the drawer the genealogy of our family and we need it to go back to people like King Arthur. So two, two plans were put into place. Now Margaret knew a, an old rogue who'd been around for years to her knowledge that the, the guy had spent most of his life in prison. He, he <coughs> was in prison for theft and debt and castle, cattle rustling and rape. He was accused of attempting to murder the Duke of Buckingham. He, he'd been in Greyfires, Blackfires, Newgate, Coles Hill, every castle you can imagine. This guy was an incarcerated... But he was quite brilliant. And everybody knew that his poetry and his work was superb. And that's what he used to do from prison, was to write this amazing stuff. So she went to him and she said, Hey, they are Thomas Mallory. Want to become a sir? Because um, I've got a job for you, Thomas Mallory. I want you to write up stories about King Arthur. I want you to prepare the best legends that England has ever had. I want them to beat the Welsh legends and the Scottish legends and the Irish legends. I want them to outdo the Sarmatians and the Volsunga Saka. I want the most colourful set of stories and I want you to make King Arthur the catalyst. And we'll make you a knight and we'll call you Sir Thomas Mallory and um, if you do that for us... Meanwhile, we've got this other fellow in Wales called uh, Richard Mostyn who's also going to be knighted if he does the job and his job is to draw up a new genealogy for the Royal House of Tudor and he's going to take this genealogy back to Uther Pendragon and King Arthur. And if we then can present that, and at the same time have your beautifully illustrated stories of King Arthur, it will be the most wonderful heritage that any dynasty could ever have. And that's how we're going to cement the House of Tudor. So Thomas Mowry and Richard of Mostyn were given these commissions, and before long, lo and behold, it all happened, and the Mort Dartha appeared, one of the first books printed in 1485 by uh, William Caxton in, in London. And um, Richard Mostyn had produced his genealogical tables. They've become known now as the Mostyn Manuscripts, and they're very, very well used. They are extremely useful to people now who, who want to prove a genealogical something or other for, for, for the English line with a vested interest because every important name in the book is in the Mostyn manuscripts and you can find that you're related to anybody if you go to those, it's, it's clever. As, as, long as, you, as long as you can link to the House of Tudor, you're, you're there. They, they fool manuscript society professors and everybody. They are, they are quoted in British Museum books as authoritative works. And yet, the story of how they came about is terribly well recorded. It's not a secret. It's just that the public don't generally know that, and if you say, oh, the Mostyn Manuscript, folio 4923B at the British Museum, that sounds very impressive, 
and uh, by the way that proves that I'm uh, descending the Luther Pendragon. Okay. The clever thing about them was that when you study the manuscripts there isn't actually too many lies in them. What's very clever is that the, the Tudor line going back into its Welsh ancestry is kind of correct. But there's a lot of lines and things all crossing over together and it gets a bit webby and, and complicated and within all of this complexity are all these other famous names and it's very easy to lose where you are and you suddenly come across somebody down here who's very famous in Vortigern and, and you think well I, I'm not quite sure how I got to him from there but well anyway I did so obviously he descended from Vortigern and, and that's the way they're read, very complex, very clever. So these became the, the documents which ultimately after the time of, of, of Mallory were used to, to show how various lines of English uh, monarchy descended from, from the family of King Arthur. In fact it doesn't say that they des he's descended from King Arthur, he's simply there in a parallel line. And the funny part about it is that these manuscripts got so complex that they were never ever cross-checked properly. And in looking at them and splitting them up, we find that in one charted section, Uther Pendragon is the son, son of Emrys ap Gwertha, and another shows him as the son of Custin and Gorinog. So in one descent his father is a Cornishman, and in the other descent his father, the father is a Welshman. And they're on different pages in different parts of the folio, but these guys are both his father, um, which clearly shows that, that, that even Mostyn got confused and forgot what he'd written about the, 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 the fellow. So anyway, what, what's happened then is that, that Arthur has, has kind of moved into an English culture that was never part of his history. He's there within the Welsh culture, which actually wasn't his history because that was a different Arthur. Um, that was the other Arthur. And it all blossomed from there as far as England and Wales were, were concerned. And, and from that time, places like Winchester in Hampshire, uh, where the round table um, conferences were, were set by Mallory, to Tintagel in Cornwall, which was Geoffrey of Monmouth's um, uh, castle for, for the great duke there, to Glastonbury even in, in Somerset and whatever, all of these English places and Welsh places got roped into the Arthurian stories. The problem was that there was no history to go along with it. Because historically, every single thing of any importance that happened in England was recorded in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles. If not there, it was recorded in additional works by Bede of Jarrow, uh, monks like him. The, 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 the existence of, of, of England's history through that uh, latter Dark Ages period is, is, is quite concise and, and very well laid out and nowhere, nowhere at all in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles is King Arthur mentioned. So it's at that point that along come the sceptics and they say well okay we know he's got this Welsh and this English heritage and whatever but historically he can't be proven therefore he must be mythical and we end up with the two factions which were there a hundred years ago and they're there still today. You know you either believe in King Arthur or you don't uh, but he can't be proved historically. Well in fact what I've really uh, said tonight is that yes he can be proved historically everything important about him his immediate family members who he was and what he was is totally proven historically it's just that it will never ever be found in welsh and english records because it's in irish and scots records and rightly so because it was an irish scots dynasty 1300s king edward iii decided to implement what he saw was a very arthurian romantic position. We had the Black Death and we've been at war with France for goodness knows how long and really it wasn't a very pleasant time to live in the country and his, his son the Black Prince had sort of come back from France and, and he said look we might not like these guys very much but they've got certain things going and there's a, there's a thing over there called courtly love and chivalry and it's all really wonderful stuff. So Edward said to the Black Prince well that's alright we can do that here. We'll set it all up and we'll, we'll do better than they've done it. 
they set up what became um, the Order of the Garter, the, the primary English knightly order as it stands now. So he said, well, we've got, to ha we've got to have a round table for this. So they built a round table. They actually had it done. This round table in, in a, a latterly painted form is what now hang hangs uh, in the Castle Hall at we uh, Winchester. So anyway, they, they set up this Order of the Garter. And that was the round table for the Order of the Garter. Originally, that table that hangs there. Now, when we get into Tudor times, Henry VIII, um, after all of the problems he's, he, the Tudors had had, trying to prove this sort of Arthurian descent and whatever, thought, well, I, I can, I'd like a bit of that table stuff. And, um, but it looks a bit boring, so we'll have it painted. So the painting that's on it was actually produced in the reign of Henry VIII, so the lovely colours and the segments and whatever. So you, you've, you've actually got there a, a relic that, that has two very distinct time frames. The reason it went to um, Winchester was because Mallory, in his portrayals of, of, of the Arthurian stories, had decided that Winchester would be a, a good place to set Camelot in the stories. And he set Camelot at Winchester. And that was OK, because Winchester was really important to Henry VII and the Tudors he was working for. Henry VIII, however, was quite happy for, for the association, but he, he just felt that there had to be more to it than that. He, he said, it, it's all very well, but, you know, Winchester and its castle hall and all of that wasn't built until a long time after King Arthur. We need something old, something that we can actually say was the court of Camelot, and I want to have been the king that discovered it. So he had this antiquary fellow called John Leyland, and he sent John Leyland out and said, go and find where Camelot was. Well, at that time, nobody was looking anywhere in particular except generally in southern England. They weren't worried about Wales then and Scotland was out of the picture. Just southern England roughly was where Camelot had to be. John Leyland came back and he said, well, I really had no success. However, there's this old site d down the, uh, in, in the West Country there, by the, not far from the river Camel and Camel and Camelot. Kind of sounds quite, quite close. Anyway, there unearthed the remains of this Dark Age feasting hall at South Cadbury. So that was the beginning of the, the Cadbury Camelot legend. I, it was decided that, that this was, you know, a very interesting place. It was of an Arthurian type and of era. It was precisely the sort of place they imagined you would have had a kingly court in the Dark Ages. What actually happened after that? That, that Henry and John Leyland knew, didn't know about, of course, in, in more recent times. They've discovered 40 more, much the same, within this immediate area, and, and dozens more than that all over the country. So it was hardly unique, and there wasn't a thing about it to ever associate it with Arthur. Nothing. Apart from its chronology was about right. So South Cadbury then <coughs> came upon the scene. So, you know, th these places... Uh, tourism interest get added to, to the Arthurian saga. They don't feature particularly. But Camelot is interesting as a concept, certainly in historical terms. The first mention of Camelot being the court of King Arthur came from the French tale called Lancelot and by Chrétien de Troyes. No, nobody had mentioned Camelot particularly as being a name for King Arthur's court. What I found was that, that if one looks historically at the use of the word Camelot in, in England, that's outside of the French use of it, it, it turns up in a different place because Chrétien de Troyes equated Camelot very precisely in that and other stories with Carlisle. And he said that the court of Camelot was at Carlisle. I thought, well, that's kind of interesting because that really ties in with, with the uh, Dalry Arden story because while Aidan McGabran, the Pendragon's court, was at Dunad, Arthur's Guletic court, the, 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 the court of the, the Guletic, as they called him, the governor of, of, of the armies of Britain, was at Carlisle. Just down the road from, from Carlisle at a place called Kirkby Stephen, even there today is the remains of this old place called the Pendragon Castle. Well, it doesn't mean to say it was a Pendragon Castle. It was just interesting that it turned up in that area. So I thought, well, I'm, I'm going to see if I can find in, in history 
from this country rather than from France where the word Camelot first appears as a definition of, of a royal court. And it turned out that it was Colchester. First court recorded as, as being a Camelot court was at Colchester. Our Colchester I in the east of, of Britain, Essex as it, it became after the Saxon invasions, was the seat of King Cymbeline, who Shakespeare wrote so nicely about. In the first century, he was the, the king of, of, of that part of Britain. And his son, Caractacus, although the father held the title, the first to be installed as the Pendragon was his son, Caractacus. So in effect, Symbol and Caractacus become the first Pendragons, Pendraco Insularis, Pendragons, kings of kings of the Britannic Isle, of, of, of a line which actually stretched on for about 600 odd years. And their court at Colchester was called Camelot. Well, I, that was intriguing, but this was still coming from, from records written way after that period. You know, it's too far after the period to, to, to get a grip on. Anyway, interestingly enough, going back to the Scots records and looking into the, um, the, the chronicles of, of, of the Scots, the, the early Scots history, uh, when talking about Carlisle being the court of Camelot, <laughs> it actually made the point that Colchester was the first Camelot in the country, with another Camelot being at Caerleon in Wales and, and their key one in, in, in Carlisle. Now, interesting, they're, they're all sort of sea places. But the interesting place was that they weren't called the Court of Camelot. They were called the King's Courts of the Camelot. And it was a hyphenated word, Camelot, which means curved light. Now that led me to, to follow another track because I thought, what the hell is curved light got to do with anything? These are courts of curved light. Well, it didn't actually take me long and I found it to start with in an old Arabic manuscript and their version of Camulot, whatever it was in Arabic, curved light, was again a definition used for the Persian kingly courts and they were the, 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 the courts where the high magic and the high alchemy took place. Um, they, they had really taken over from what used to be the, the ancient Egyptian and Mesopotamian and Babylonian temples where the priests were involved in all sorts of weird and wonderful stuff and it was said that they could curve and bend light. And the tradition sort of came over here and it carried on. These were courts of curved light. Now I've never been able to ascertain whether that meant anything particular in this country but Camelot as a romantic name turns out to be a description of the type of court that it was. So although the court at Carlisle was a court of Camelot, or a court of the Camelot, the king, the Pendragon's court at Dunad wasn't. And the secondary king's court at Dumbarton, again, wasn't. The places that are listed, Carlisle, Caerleon, Colchester, all Camelot. The other interesting thing was that Colchester and Carlisle were both recorded as the Caerleon. Well, the only place that retained that name was the Caerleon in Wales. But in fact, Colchester and Carlisle, also courts of the Camelot, were called Caerleon, which simply meant City of the Legion. And so the Caerleon title it, it, it seemed to come because of the fact that the Romans set up their legion headquarters in these old magical courts. In, it, they took them over. God knows what they were looking for or trying to achieve, but they knew that there was something very special about those places. So they became Caerleon. They became the main cities, the centres of the legion. There was no succession in, in the Pendragons. There was no father-to-son succession. They used to have a druidic council of elders, and they would appoint the next Pendragon from an overall Gaelic royal stock. Mostly families were related, Welsh, Irish, Scots, Northumbrian, they could be almost any of those things, Cambrian. And, and they would simply pick the, the king who they thought was going to be the next in line. And during the course of the picking, they didn't wait for the old Pendragon to die. They, they'd pick the successor during the lifetime 
of the old Pendragon, and he would then be charged with training his son in the pursuit of the Camelot. So Arthur becomes High King by virtue of the fact that he is destined to be the next Pendragon. That's the plan. So what you have is a father and son more or less of equal responsibility in governing the realm except for the fact that dad knows more about alchemy than his son and he's going to teach him. So we move Arthur into the potential Pendragonship of the country. Why didn't he get it? What happened? Because what happens is that the next Pendragon is not Arthur. And you look at the lists. Should have been. The stories of King Arthur are most interesting historically when you read the historical stuff. And what I find so fascinating about it is that it is actually more adventurous and more romantic than the reality. Arthur is said to have been first mentioned in history by the monk Nennius, 9th century. We're told that that's the first mention of Arthur. But in fact, that is absolutely untrue. There is mention of Arthur in lots of records that was simply the first mention down south. The 7th century life of St. Columba tells about Arthur's father, King Aidan, <coughs> talking to Columba and saying, look, you know, what's, what's actually going to happen here? Because we're battling all the time. I really, Arthur's being trained as, as king. I need to know which of my sons are going to succeed me. I mean, you, you, this, this is not secret information. You can buy this in Waterstones now. The life of St. Columba is still a published work. And um, Columba actually c confides as a sort of prophecy that, that it won't be Arthur, it'll be one of the others, as it turned out historically it was. What Nennius did was to, to give us lots of clues about Arthur's life as a commander. He listed a number of battlefields in his history where Arthur <coughs> fought and was either or was or wasn't victorious. And every one of those battlefields is recorded in the Scottish Chronicles. Every one of the battles that Nennius mentioned is recorded in the Scottish Chronicles. So there's no doubt that when this monk down here decided to write up this history, he did know what he was talking about. They include the Caledonian Wood to the north of Carlisle, Mount Agnid, which was the fort of Bremenium in the Cheviots, and they repelled the Anglo-Saxons from there. Um, Arthur's story got sort of messed up in this country because his tradition moved into Europe. There were Breton connections with the Welsh and the Irish and with the west of England. In fact, Brittany is Little Britain. It was settled from, from this part of the world in the first place and it became um, a, a sort of British-run province under the uh, Frankish kings. So you start to get the conjoined stories. But one of the fascinating things about the stories is that the knights of the Holy Grail, the knights of the round table, then begin to become a part of it. They weren't part of any English law, really, until the 1100s. And suddenly these knights and the round table and the Grail quest <coughs> appear out of Champagne and um, Anjou, uh, from mainly from Templar-based courts. What was fascinating about these was that they were portraying what essentially was a very Christian state of affairs. They're talking about the Holy Grail, they're talking about the church, they're talking about all these knights and there are crosses and things all over the place and Arthur is a, is a, a very Christian sort of king in the way that it's portrayed. But a lot of these knights had Jewish names. Jewish names seem to crop up all over the place in the stories. The most famous, of, uh, of course, being Galahad, who wasn't called Galahad until Thomas Mallory called him Galahad. It was originally Gilead. And Gilead is, is a name that turns up many times in the Old Testament. Gilead was the Mount of Witness. G Gilead was uh, where, where the, the pile of stones of Witness was built for, for Jacob's pillow and things like that. Then you've got other knights. You've got, you've got names turning up like Hebron, Hebron. 
and Bron, and then you've got people called the rich fishers. And if you go back into Bible history, you've got the rich fishers of, of Judea and whatever. So it becomes very, very Jewish. Why? Why? Because at that time, Jews had pretty well been expelled from Europe. 1209, the final expulsion came in Britain. And every Jew in this country, except for one who happened to be the king's doctor, was expelled from the country. And yet this is at a time when famous Jewish people of, of history in some way or another are being brought to the fore. Then along came a chap called Robert de Boron and he made more of the story. He told us how, how the Grail Knights were linked up with earlier times. He told us a Grail and Arthurian story that would seem to be set in the time of Joseph of Arimathea and Jesus. He talked about the Holy Grail being the cup of the Last Supper. And it became very Jewish. But at the same time, the Jews were being hounded and, and suppressed throughout Europe. Why? Well, the, the European courts tell us that basically this was a European story. And if you read the uh, thing called the Grand St. Grail, the ultimate um, upholder, it was said, of the Grail was not King Arthur, but Judas Maccabeus, who in, in, in the second century BC was the fellow who freed Jerusalem and Judea from Syrian oppression. Once we start to look at the stories of Judas Maccabeus and read the biblical books of the Maccabees the, in the Apocrypha and whatever, we find stories there that again, like the, the Norse tales and the Scythian tales, begin to parallel stories in the Arthurian sagas. And at the end, we end up with such a mishmash of, of information that it becomes very difficult to know where the legends begin and where they end. The round table itself is, is, is a fascinating concept. Ring lore was very, very prominent in all of these ancient cultures, certainly in Scythia, uh, certainly in Mesopotamia. The king of kings in, in countries outside of Britain was called the Ring Lord, or as Tolkien cares to call them, the Lord of the Rings. And kings of various <coughs> regions had rings of office. And there was one king, the Pendragon type king, who held the one ring and he governed all the others and he was the lord of all, all the rings. That didn't happen in Britain. Ring law wasn't really British. The only person who ever made it British was in the 1950s and that was Tolkien. Well, actually, not true. <coughs> it was made British in the 12th century when the Grail story and Arthurian romantic writers thought, hey, this is rather good. And this is before King Edward stole the idea for his Knights of the Garter. And he said, this ring thing is, is kind of interesting. It revolves around a very old law that says that the ring is the most eternal object. It has no beginning, it has no end. While everything is in harmony and runs perfectly, the ring is as it is. The trouble is, when you break a ring, you've really got a problem because putting a ring back together is difficult. And the stories in ring law <coughs> were always the same. Rings got stolen and in the end rings got broken. And when rings got broken, chaos reigned. One way or another, the purity of the ring was all that could save what was deemed good. Evil would succeed when rings were broken. And this was very, very cleverly brought into Arthurian law. Never existed before. There was no mention of Knights of the Round Table before this happened, but they brought Nordic and Mesopotamian ring law into the Arthurian theme in two ways. And they, it was beautiful the way they did it because they intermingled two rings. First, you've got the golden ring of Arthur uh, and his marriage oath to Guinevere, the normal wedding ring. But quite a lot is made in the stories about this ring, about how you know Arthur had to fight to win her hand and all that sort of thing. So to, to get her to take this ring was quite a thing, and it was very important that she took the ring. As her marriage dowry, what she gave him in return was the order of the Knights of the Round Table. She created the order and gave it to him as a gift. And the object was that the knights would sit around this table in a ring. <laughs> 
but they would never sit in Congress without wearing their armour. This is the, the theory behind the story. The moment you have these knights around a table wearing their armour, they become an ironclad ring. And the way that the Arthurian story got the best out of all of the other ring legends was that it roped the two together and it achieved a situation where the ring of knights, the round table, was broken because of Guinevere's affair with Lancelot which broke the marriage vow of the other ring. And since Lancelot was a knight who sat at the table, both rings were simultaneously broken. And from that moment, that's when the land falls into chaos and waste. That's when we're told that, that if everything is to return to fertility, they have to go in search of the Holy Grail. And um, that's really where the stories kind of, kind of end, apart from the, the death of Arthur. The knights have gone off into the wasteland. They're looking now for, for what it is that will repair the ring, because it's, there's now a space at the table. And so ring law becomes a part of Arthurian legend and it seems that there's nothing which in one way or another, where if we start with Nennius and we work right the way forward to Alfred Lord Tennyson and we pick up all of these aspects that have got added throughout the history of Arthurian romance, every item that was important in the cultural law of other countries of, of, of Europe was brought into play in the Arthurian legend. So they've ended up being the most concise overall legend of all time. Which is quite astonishing because they're presented as a set of very flimsy little stories really.